All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to everyone here in the room. Also, welcome to everybody who's participating online. Uh, we have our open forum on AI regulation and governance uh, at the multilateral level now. My name is Moritz Fromageau. I'm part of the Office of the UN Secretary General Envoys on Technology. Um, let me quickly do some walk you through the agenda of the day. Uh, we will start this off by some panel remarks by our esteemed guests here, and then we'll have a big Q&A session in which we want to engage uh, with you, the audience. Um, we will start this off with uh, keynote remarks by Amandeep Gill, who is the Secretary General's Envoy on Technology. And after that, um, Peggy Hicks, um, Director at the UN um, Human Rights Office, will moderate uh, the panel. And after that, we'll go over to the Q&A session. Yeah, without further ado, uh, I would hand over to Amandeep to introduce uh, the topic. Thank you very much, Moritz. Uh, welcome to this uh, event, uh, this discussion on AI governance and the very important dimension of human rights, the role of human rights in how we approach AI governance. So uh, to set a little bit the context, uh, I want to talk about the Secretary General's proposal in his policy brief on the Global Digital Compact that he launched on June 5th this year. Uh, for a multi-stakeholder, high-level advisory body for artificial intelligence that, as the ST said, would meet regularly to review AI governance arrangements and offer recommendations on how they can be aligned with human rights, the rule of law, and the common good. Uh, this proposal that he reiterated in his remarks to the first Security Council debate on artificial intelligence uh, in uh, July is currently being put into practice. So this advisory body um, is being formed as we speak uh, after a process for nominations uh, that uh, ran along two tracks. One was member states being invited to nominate experts um, to the Secretariat, and the other was an open call for nominations. And all together, we got about 1,800 nominations from around the world. So uh, different areas of expertise, uh, backgrounds, different geographies. So it's very satisfying to see that degree of interest uh, and excitement about this proposal. So we kind of hit uh, uh, the right spot uh, with this. Now, what is the advisory body when it comes together? Uh, what is it supposed to do? The Secretary General has tasked it uh, to provide an interim report uh, by the end of the year. Uh, and there is a context to this timing. Uh, the discussions on the Global Digital Compact start early next year, restart early next year. They move into a negotiation phase. So this interim report would help uh, those who are putting together the GDC to consider one of the more important dimensions. You know, There are these eight important high-level dimensions along with the cross-cutting themes of gender and sustainability that have surfaced through the consultation. So it'll bring more substance uh, and expert level insight into that discussion. So after that, uh, there is time for the advisory body to uh, consult more widely, including with ongoing initiatives. Uh, you heard the, uh, the Japanese Prime Minister speak about the G7 Hiroshima process. Uh, there is the UK AI Summit. Uh, there has been work that's been done earlier in the G7, G20 on AI principles. And there is long-standing work in the UN context. And today, I'm very happy to be joined by some of my colleagues. The work in UNESCO on the ethics of AI, a consensus recommendation adopted by all member states. The work in the International Telecommunication Union uh, on and some of the standards that underpin uh, digital technologies, but also the at the AI for Good meetings. Uh, and then, uh, most importantly, from the 
perspective of the SG's vision and today's topic, the work being done by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on how to um, make sure that existing commitments that governments, member states have taken uh, under international human rights instruments, they are implemented in the digital domain. So I just want to conclude by saying that um, this uh, body that will start meeting soon would help us pool multidisciplinary AI expertise uh, from around the world to provide a credible and independent assessment of AI risks um, and make recommendations to governments on options for global AI governance in the interest of all humanity. I think those conversations that are happening today, they are very important, they are essential building blocks. But if this is an issue that concerns all humanity, then all humanity needs to be engaged on it uh, through the uh, universal forum that is the uh, United Nations. The risk discussion can often be um, political or it can be um, motivated by economic interests. We want a discussion in which there is uh, an independent neutral assessment of that risk and a communication of that to, uh, the, uh, uh, to um, the global community at large. At the same time, we also need to make sure that the opportunities and the enablers that are required for AI to play a role in the acceleration of progress on the sustainable development goals, they are also assessed, they are also presented in a sober uh, manner to the international community. So looking at the risks and the opportunities in this kind of manner allows us to put the right governance uh, responses in place, um, uh, whether they are at the international level or at the national uh, regional regulatory level or at the level of industry where there may be self-regulation, co-regulation schemes uh, to address uh, risks, um, including through the kind of uh, initiatives that the uh, Japanese uh, minister uh, uh, shared yesterday. So I'll stop there and hand it uh, to Peggy for the for moderating the panel. Thank you, Peggy. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we're, we're so fortunate to have Amandeep with us uh, to give us that overall perspective about where we stand on these issues now. Um, I'm going to have the pleasure, I'm Peggy Hicks with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and I'll have the pleasure of moderating the panel, but also uh, giving some introductory remarks from the Human Rights Office perspective starting out to just sort of um, set the course for us by making sort of four introductory uh, remarks. One is that I think when we're looking at the issues of AI governance, we need to, to be able to have a complex conversation. Uh, we tend to throw out the term AI and think that we all know what we're talking about. Um, we tend to talk about existential risk, near-term risk, short-term, mid-term risk, with no real definitions on the table. We need to break the conversation down. We need to be aware that there are areas that are already existing. AI that's in use, being used in human rights sensitive and critical areas like law enforcement, where we don't have any question about what needs to be done. We just need to implement the things that we already know. Recommendations have already been made about the guardrails that should be in place, for example, on mass surveillance technologies, to protect privacy and in other places. We need to move forward on that and we don't have to wait to do that. But then we also have the issues that have uh, really rushed to the surface around generative AI where there is a real need to look at what are the new challenges that are presented and even within that area, some are immediate in terms of, for example, uh, the impact of, of deep fakes, the need for water uh, marking and provenance uh, to be put in place as quickly as possible, transparency around uh, data sets for large language models. So there are things that we can do urgently even within that emerging space. Um, but then we have to also be able to look forward at the same time to what are the risks that, that are in our future that we see and to be able to do the hard work of putting in place the governance uh, mechanisms and approaches that will allow us to make sure that we're tackling not just what we already know but what we foresee for the future. Um, the next point I want to emphasize is that that is a global challenge. 
Um, and as much as we appreciate all the different efforts at the national and regional level, we need to be able to come together in a global way to address these issues. We need to be able to learn from each other. We need to recognize that the solutions won't work if they're only solutions that are adopted and, and taken in one place. Um, and for that global engagement to work, we need to create a level playing field. And that means that there needs to be much greater investment and resources and, and engagement with the global majority um, that may have um, more difficulty being part of these policy making <coughs> conversations going forward. The third piece is one that of course comes up in the IGF context all the time is around what we mean by multi-stakeholder and how that has to be part of the governance approach that we undertake in AI. And I want to emphasize that when we talk multi-stakeholderism, we are talking both in terms of the business side of things and the civil society side of things. And in fact, what we need on each of those pieces is quite different. With regards to business, there's a tendency to really look at how we engage and, and, and to some extent mitigate the, the extent that a, a small number of companies have an enormous influence in this space. But at the same time, um, we need to create a race to the top where those companies may be the ones that are best prepared to put in place some of the guardrails that we need, but we also need to protect against the way other businesses will come into the sector and are coming in, perhaps with less incentive to put those same guardrails in place as we go forward. On the civil society side, we all know that that is an area where um, there's a lot of commitment to general participation, but perhaps not as much to effective engagement. And we need a, a different pathway. We need to draw on the expertise. We need to make sure that civil society is present because they're the ones that will help us to make sure that no one's left behind. And finally, and you won't be surprised to hear me say this, um, I want to put, make a pitch for human rights uh, and the human rights framework as being a crucial tool to allow us to move forward in all of these areas effectively. We've heard in many of the sessions I've been in already at the IGF how we have to build on what already exists and not create everything afresh. Well, the human rights framework is a framework that has been agreed across continents, across contexts. It's cel celebrating its 75th anniversary today, my pin shows. Um, and we need to find a way that we leverage it um, in this space. But that also requires support for us to be able to do that more effectively. It, requires all of us to move from sort of the talking point of yes, we're grounded in human rights to making it actionable um, in a variety of ways in the policy making context. So those are the introductory remarks from my side, but I'm very much looking forward to hearing from the contributors today. And I'm very pleased that um, we're going to turn first, I guess, to, to Benga Sassan, who's the executive director of Paradigm Initiative and a member of the IGF leadership panel. So over to you, Benga. Thank you, Peggy, and thank you, Amandeep, uh, for the earlier comments. I think it's it's important to start with uh, the so the three areas that has that have been identified by the by the you know Secretary General in terms of human rights, uh, rule of law, and common good help you know with with the ongoing conversation. But let me let me start with a statement. Someone so at the opening ceremony, uh, someone uh, who sat I think behind me. Um, Yes, behind me. I, I shouldn't confuse behind with beside. <laughs> uh, you know, leaned over after the session and said, look at the stage, there's no diversity. And uh, during the AI, pa AI panel, um, and, and then we had a conversation. And the conversation we had wasn't just about diversity, but was about many things. And, and Peggy, you're right, uh, civil society already, uh, I mean, AI is not new. Uh, it's been said that AI is the unofficial theme for 2023 IGF. I'm sure if you got a dollar for every time AI is mentioned here, you all be billionaires already. Uh, you know, so, and, and also there's, there's a tendency for us to assume that the conversation we're having is understood by everyone and we're all at the same level, but we're not. Uh, so first of all, there are people whose level of inclusion, even before you have conversations of AI, are not er exactly, we, we already have a divide. Right? We already have a divide that is contributed to by some of the problems that we have that civil society is trying to address. And so three very quick things for me. Number one is that in all of this conversation, of course, uh, we've talked about the need for human rights, for the rule of law, and for the common good. But I think the common good will only be served if we have a conversation that is based on ethics. And I say this because if you look at all of the race, literally, like 
the AI race that we had over the last few months, uh, and I'm sure we'll hear a bit more you know, uh, from the private sector representative on this, uh, and at some point, there had to be a call to say, guys, let's stop. Uh, and the reason for that was because it then, you know, it became a race literally without rules. And everybody was trying to get to be the first to do it. Uh, of course, there are many reasons for that. There's the economic incentive and there are other, you know, the first come advantage and all of that. But those conversations must be built on ethics. And thankfully, uh, we already have many frameworks around human rights that can guide us in this. So it's not, we're not creating new principles. We're not saying that, you know, the ethics should be based on new inventions. We already have principles for that. The second is on data protection. And I say this particularly because we've had many conversations about the need for data privacy and protection, uh, but there are many countries where there are still, for example, majority, uh, you know, so we, we do a, a paradigm initiative, we do a report every year on the state of the internet on digital rights uh, across the African continent. And one of the major challenges that we have is that there are many countries that do not even have data protection frameworks already. And not only are they now talking about uh, you know, just collecting biometric data, but they're also talking about AI. They're talking about massive, you know, data uh, projects, and that is important. So ethics, also data protection. And I'll come back to the first point that I made uh, about, about diversity. Not just diversity in terms of conversation. It's great to have a panel, uh, and I'm at times, <laughs> at times I think with tokenism you can solve the problem, but we need to go beyond the tokenism. Uh, I think that the importance is not just in the conversations, but also in the modeling. Uh, I always give the example of my very first exa you know, experience uh, with an AI demo uh, you know, somewhere you know, not too far from here. Um, and I, you know, stood in front of this machine where everyone was standing and they were testing and it would tell you where in the world you're from and tell you a bit more about yourself based on the data you had been fed with. And then I faced this machine and I said, hi, and I said, hello, and I said a few words. And the machine not only said I was from the wrong continent, but also said I was very angry. And, and I was like, wait a second, what is going on here? And by the way, that project was already being used by a country to determine uh, who to arrest based on prank calls. So it meant that anyone who sounds, I, I sound like this all the time because I'm Nigerian. I'm from a country of 200 million people. You need to raise your voice to be heard. So when I speak, I need to raise my voice. So if the machine thinks I'm angry and all that, it's not because I am, it's because I'm Nigerian and I have to raise my voice. Uh, so I think it's, it's ab you know, absolutely important for us, not just in conversations, but in modeling and also in research. AI by nature is global, but global does not mean it happens in the global north. Global means that it has applications across the entire world, and if it has, then it means that diversity must be a fundamental factor in what we do. Otherwise, we're going to keep having many of the problems we currently have on social media where platforms are struggling to interpret something that is understood within a context and means something else entirely once it crosses to another context. So, ethics, data protection, and diversity. Thank you very much, Benga. Uh, words to live by there, and I'm sure we'll go back to each of those three points. But I understand that uh, Gabriel Ramos is now online and able to join us, so I'd like to introduce Gabriel Ramos, who is the Assistant Director General of Social and Human Sciences at UNESCO. Over to you, Gabriel. Thank you so much, Peggy, and uh, I'm very sorry, but I got the wrong link. And I was with a very technical expert. <laughs> very interesting session, but it was not mine. Uh, great to be here with you. And um, thank you. Great to, to share uh, this panel with you and with Amandeep. And uh, I could not agree more with what the, the previous speaker mentioned. I think that ethics is, uh, is a, good, a good guide because it's not only about uh, the challenges we are confronting now, but actually the challenges that might be posed to us uh, with these very fast uh, uh, um, moving technologies. And, and we are now probably uh, questioning all these issues uh, brought by the generative AI, uh, but AI is not good, no new. And, and we know uh, since how many years AI has been used to um, take decisions that are substantial and relevant for all of us. Uh, we know um, the, the, the application of these technologies in uh, uh, the uh, uh, distribution of benefits in the, in the welfare system, uh, the health system, the education system, 
uh, we know how much um, facial recognition has been used and now is being debated how much we can rely on it uh, to take decisions in the public sector. But the public and the private sector have been taking decisions based on AI for many years. Uh, we tend to forget, but we know that uh, having a vaccine uh, to fight the COVID pandemic uh, was actually allowed because of the analytical capacities that the technologies could put together to understand how the virus uh, work. So, so it's not new, but, but, the, but the questions that we ask, of course, are much more relevant uh, given the pervasiveness and also the faster speed at which these developments are advanced. So it's very important that, that, that we have the, the, the right frameworks. Um, if, if these major technologies are just deployed in the, in the, in the, in the markets, uh, for geopolitical reasons, for commercial reasons, for profit-making reasons, uh, is not going to work. And that's why we are very pleased to be contributing to this uh, uh, framing of the technologies in the right manner at UNESCO. Um, as since two years ago, we, the 193 member states adopted the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And I recognize Amandeep was one of the ma major contributors because he was part of the, of the multidisciplinary group that we put together to develop the recommendation. And, and it was pretty straightforward, but I feel it was also uh, in the right frame because the question was uh, not to go into a technological debate of how do we fix the technologies or how do we build the technologies in certain ways to, to deliver for what we want to have in the world. Uh, but the question was actually, what are the values that we are pursuing? And then we put it all around. It's a societal debate, not a technological debate. And the values, we know them. The values that the technologies should serve are the human rights and human dignity, are the fairness, inclusiveness, protection, privacy. Uh, and, these, and these values need to be served by certain principles or goals uh, and you know them because these uh, goals are of accountability, transparency, proportionality, the rule of law. These principles are part of the of the of the equation that have been advanced by many many players in the in the artificial intelligence uh, ecosystem. But these principles need to be translated uh, from our perspective into policies because policies is what will make the difference. Yes, the technologies are being developed by the private sector mainly, but this will not be different as many other sectors that we have in the economy where governments need to provide with the framework and the right framework for them to develop according to the law. And at the end, it's, it's not that the, the governments are going to go into this every single AI lab uh, to check uh, that, uh, that we have diverse teams, that the quality of the data is there, that the training of the algorithm uh, has uh, the adequate checkpoints not to be um, tainted by, by biases and, and prejudice. But at the end, when you have the norm and when you have the tools and the audit systems to advance these kind of outcomes is when you get things right. And this is, this is where we are now in the conversation because uh, the, the member states, when they adopted the recommendation, it was not only left to the goodwill of, of, of uh, anybody who wanted to advance in building these legal frameworks, but they also asked UNESCO to help them advance specific tools for implementation, because we are also are in an heterogeneity of capacities and, and systems that can be put together. And therefore, we, we developed two tools to understand where member states are regarding the recommendation, the readiness assessment methodology that is not only a technological discussion again, it is about the capacities of, 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 of countries uh, to shape these technologies, to understand these technologies and, and to have the legal frameworks that are necessary for them to deliver. And then we also develop the ethical impact assessment. And I feel that now we are converging with many uh, other institutions and, and, and organizations that are advancing better frameworks for developing on AI. Just last Friday, we were with the, with the Dutch uh, Digital Authority because this is also an institutional debate. For us, it's, this is for, for governments. Governments need to up upgrade their capacities and the way they handle these technologies because, as I said, I'm a policy person and the reality is that this is about 
shaping an economic sector. An economic sector that, yes, pervades many other sectors and is changing the way all the other sectors is working, but at the end is an economic sector. The way the, the, the technologies are produced can be shaped, can be determined by technical standards, but it can also be determined by the rule of law. And it's not as, um, as difficult as it might seem in terms of at least having these guardrails. Uh, when we say, for example, that we need to ensure human determination, uh, well, then what the recommendation established is that we cannot provide AI developments with legal personality. And I feel this is just the very basic to ensure that whenever something goes wrong, there is going to be a person, there is going to be a, somebody that is in charge and that can be legal uh, liable, li liable legally. And then we also need to have systems for uh, redressal mechanisms and to ensure that the rule of law is, is really ensured uh, online. I'm, I'm, I'm proud that we have this framework uh, is now being really deployed by 40 countries around the world and, and we will be having more. Next week, we are going to be in Latin America launch, launching the Council, the Business, the, the Iberoamerican Council for the implementation of the recommendation. And we're partnering with many institutions, with the European Union, with the Development Bank in Latin America, with the Patrick McGovern Foundation, with Bilasar, to ensure that we work with member states to look how they can build up these capacities to understand the technologies and to deliver better frameworks. Uh, we always also talk about skills, 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 skills to understand, to frame, to advance uh, a better deployment of the technologies. I feel that it's also very important that we have the skills in the public sector to, to, to frame and to understand because these are also so fastly moving technologies that we need to be able to anticipate also the, the, the impacts that they can have in many fields that have not been tested. But if you ask me for the bottom line, the bottom line, and I think this is not the way that uh, uh, generative AI or chat GPT arrived to the market, it, uh, is that you need to have an ethical impact assessment, a human rights impact assessment of major developments on artificial intelligence because before they reach the markets. I think this is the just right due diligence. And, and it's not what is happening in many of these developments as we see them. And therefore, I think it's, 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 it's the moment to put the conversation right, right in, the, in, the, in the right framework to ensure that, uh, that this technology is del delivered for good. And, and we are seeing many movement. We just saw the bill that was put together in the, in the, in the US Congress. We, we know what the, the European Union is doing. We know how many countries are advancing this. And we're also doing it with the private sector. We can, we can neither put all the private sector in one basket. We're, we're working with Microsoft and Telefonica because also this needs to be a multi-stakeholder approach also gathering um, the, the civil society and many, many groups that need to be represented because the ethics of artificial intelligence concern us all. I'm, I'm so glad that I have this, this uh, minute to share with you these uh, thoughts. And I'm looking forward to the to the exchanges. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gabriela. It's it's wonderful to hear your comments based on the experience of UNESCO and the ethics of AI development, but also its application, as you said, and the work that's being done globally uh, to move forward on on these issues. And I think the point uh, that you make around human rights impact assessments and the, uh, need for them to be uh, done before things reach the market is one that, that we'll come back to as well. Um, I'd like to turn to our final panelists now. We're fortunate to have with us Owen Lartner, who's Director of Public Policy uh, in the Office of Responsible AI at Microsoft. Over to you, Owen. Thank you, Peggy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be part of such an esteemed uh, panel. Um, so as Peggy mentioned, I'm Owen Larter at Microsoft. We are very enthusiastic about the opportunity of AI. We're excited to see the way in which customers are already using our Microsoft co-pilots to, to better use our productivity tools. We talk a lot about co-pilots at Microsoft rather than autopilots. The, the vision for Microsoft around AI is very much retaining the, the human dignity and the human agency at the center of things. Um, and I think more broadly, we see AI as a huge range of tools that is gonna offer humanity 
an immense amount of opportunity really to understand and manage complex systems better and to be able to, to address major challenges like climate change, like healthcare, like a lot of um, what is being addressed in the SDGs. So a lot of opportunity, but I think it's clear that there is risk, as we have heard uh, very well um, articulated across the panel. And so we need to think about governance. And I think as we turn to governance of AI, we need to think about governance globally. As it was said before, AI is an international technology. It is the product of collaboration across borders. We need to allow people to be able to continue to collaborate in developing and using AI across borders. It's also quite clear that the risks that AI presents are international. They transcend boundaries. An AI system created in one part of the world can cause harm in another part of the world, either intentionally or via accident. And so I think as we think about global governance, it, it's worth taking a little bit of a step back and sort of understanding where we are. And I do feel like an enormous amount more work is needed, but we've made a huge amount of progress in the last year. We're, we're coming up to quite an important milestone or a significant milestone, which is that we're just a few weeks shy of the one year anniversary of ChatGPT being launched on the 30th of November in 2022 and you know I think we can see the way in which that has really changed the conversation around the world on these issues I think it's fantastic to see the way in which the UN has done what the UN is always very good at doing which is really catalyzing a global and representative conversation on these issues we're excited about the high level um, advisory uh, body we think that's going to be really productive work really delighted to be working with UNESCO um, to be able to take forward their recommendation on uh, artificial intelligence we think that's a really important um, piece of work and, and really exciting to see the way in which you now have concrete safety frameworks being developed and implemented around the world. People might be familiar with the NIST AI Risk Management Framework. This is from the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the US. They published their AI Risk Management Framework at the start of this year. It really is a, a global best practice framework that any organization can use now to develop their own internal, internal responsible AI program. So I, I think we've sort of moved to a place where we have the building blocks of a global governance framework in place. I think now it really behooves us to take a bit of a step back and think about how we chart a way forward. And I think there's probably a couple of things that are worth bearing in mind as we do that. First is sort of having a bit more of a conversation about where we actually want to get to. What do we want a global governance regime for AI actually to be able to achieve? And then secondly, what can we learn from the many attempts and the many successes around global governance in other regimes? So I'll offer a, a few thoughts um, in closing. I, I think as we move forward, we, we ultimately want to get to a place where we are setting global standards that are being developed in a representative and global way that can then be implemented by national governments around the world. And I think there are great lessons to draw from organizations like ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, part of the UN family. It does a great job of including pretty much every country around the world in developing safety and security standards for aviation globally. So I think there's more that we can learn from that. I think the other thing that we need a global governance regime to do is to help us develop more of a consensus on the risks of AI. It's a really important part of thinking about how we, we address them. So I think of organizations like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which has done a fantastic job of developing an evidence-based consensus around risks in relation to climate. And actually, a really effective job of then taking that out and driving a public conversation, which can lay the groundwork for policy as well. And I think that the final suggestion I'll make is that we really need to invest in infrastructure as we move away forward. That's both the technical infrastructure so that we're able to study these systems in a, in a holistic and broad way. It is very intensive to develop and use these systems, so we need to provide publicly available compute data and models so that researchers around the world can better understand these systems, can develop the much needed evaluations that we need um, going forward. I think the other bit that is just as important, if not more so, is thinking about the, the sort of social infrastructure. How do we really have a global conversation on a sustained way on these issues that is properly representative and brings in views from everywhere around the world, including the global south? I think it's a great start on that front. I think conversations like this and um, uh, work that the IGF is doing is really important. I think there's more that can be done. What, one small contribution that we've made so far and we want to do more is setting up a global responsible AI fellowship. So we have a number of fellows around the world, including from countries like Nigeria and Sri Lanka and India and Kyrgyzstan, where we're bringing together some of the, the best and brightest minds working on responsible AI right across the global south to help shape more of a global conversation and inform the way that we at Microsoft are thinking about responsible AI. I think there's much more opportunity to do this kind of thing when we're moving forward. But I'll, I'll pause there for now.
Great. Thanks so much, Owen. It's been really helpful to hear your comments on, on what the global governance AI challenge looks like and what are some of the next steps we need to take. Um, just to pull together some of the thoughts and then we're going to turn over for the question and answer. I mean, I think we heard very, very similar messages to some extent from our, from our somewhat diverse panel, not as diverse as we need to be probably here either, uh, Benga. But, um, but we, we all recognize the need for that global diversity. Um, how we achieve it, I think we still have a lot of work to, to do. Um, we can, uh, you know, commit to it in principle, but in practice, it requires a lot more effort, a lot more resources to make it uh, a reality, I think. Um, we also heard uh, the importance of really putting in place guardrails based on what we already know um, in the space and, and moving forward on them, the, the governance conversation um, with uh, regards to, to the best practices is there, but we also rec need to recognize that we do have some red lines and those red lines ought to be part of the global standard setting process as well and moving forward. And finally, we also need to, to understand the need for greater transparency, greater ability for a global conversation to happen, and that means making sure that, that forums like this one are available uh, to a much broader audience, but that we have, I liked uh, Owen's comments about the social infrastructure that's needed, um, and that will require investment and commitment as well to move forward. So with that, uh, I think I will close this first segment of the, the panel discussion, and I'm to turn over to Moritz, uh, who will guide us in the question and answer. Over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Peggy. So we will now take the time for an extensive question and answer. Uh, so you'll all have the possibility to yeah, ask any question uh, you might have. Unfortunately, Amandeep had to already leave the session, but our colleague Quinton is filling in. Uh, also, I understood that Benga uh, has, to, has to leave it uh, in, in 20 minutes as well, so we might just prioritize uh, you in the process. And I'm also seeing that we have, that we have the co-facilitators from the Global Digital Compact in the room, so do let uh, us know if you want to, um, to participate in the discussion. Uh, for the on-site uh, on questions, you can line up behind the microphone over there. It's first come, first serve. We collect the first three questions and then uh, answer them from the panel. And yeah, so feel free to uh, ask anything <laughs> regarding the session topic. <laughs> okay, that's a, a nice clarification. <laughs> uh, hello everyone, I'm Alice Lena from Brazil. I'm also a consultant for GRI, the Global Index on Responsible AI. And I have a question uh, that I think has relations with everything that you, you said so far. Because we've, we've been listening in all the panels on AI that AI must be regulated through a global lens, right? It can't be just national frameworks. And we've been also been listening that uh, it must happen now, it's urgent. And these things, uh, we know that global regulations are not the fastest regulations we have. So my question is how do we balance this both um, these, these needs. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm an attorney at law from Sri Lanka. Um, last year I just did a course uh, from the CIDP in Washington and I've been studying AI policy. I was just wondering if the biggest threat uh, is that the technology is running far ahead of the law. And um, is there any possibility, like we were speaking of global AI regime, et cetera, is there any possibility that punitive measures like fines or penalties can be given to these tech companies which are going ahead without the implications, the human rights aspect, the ethics, with, without that being examined, if the tech companies put out the tech, is a, I, I, I feel the only way is to penalize them somehow, like how GDPR brought huge fines. Um, is there any conversation on that going on, or just want to know? Hello, my name is Eva Poulet, and I am vice chairman of uh, IFAP UNESCO uh, program, and my specialty is infoethics, and I am chairing a working group on infoethics at UNESCO. 
Uh, I think we are agreeing all together about ethical values. The, uh, I think there are a certain number of ethical values which are, which are recognized by UNESCO recommendation, by EU regula regulation, by OECD, and these ethical values are very well known. That's dignity, that's autonomy, that's definitively fairness, that's diversity, that's uh, the problem of uh, security and well-being and so and so. So the problem is not the ethical values. I, I think that uh, Gabriela was right. The problem with ethics is not the, the um, problem of designing uh, the ethical values, but the problem is to what extent these ethical values are met in a concrete situation. And that's another problem, and that's another difficulty. And that's why I think we need to have definitively a s uh, legislation imposing what I would call ethical assessment. I think that's very important to have this ethical assessment. At a micro level, it means at the company level. And this ethical assessment needs absolutely uh, to have what we call a multi-stakeholders within uh, the company and perhaps the customer, perhaps the clients, and I don't know exactly uh, which must be uh, uh, around the table, but we need to have this multi-stakeholders and multidisciplinary assessment to, uh, to clearly uh, enunciate the risk, to mitigate the risk, and definitively uh, to try to avoid uh, this, the main risk. And that's very, very important, I, I think. If we have this ethical uh, assessment at the micro level, I think that's the most important thing. At the global level, I think we need definitively uh, to have the d discussion, discussion about uh, a very important issue like the increased man. It is quite clear that bioethics and infoethics tomorrow will join together. It is quite clear that definitely we must have a certain number of reflection about AI generative system, especially as we get the problem of manipulation of people uh, and, and all these questions. So my question is to know what's your position about this uh, reflection. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Mm, just one suggestion, uh, I think for the next round of questions, uh, you could also um, say whom on the panel uh, you address the question to, then we can have it a bit more targeted. So, um, yeah, three questions. The first one on how to balance the need for quick action um, <laughs> in the face of some of la global processes that, that can take a little, little longer. Um, second questions on enforcement. How do we make sure that um, that the rules that we agreed on are actually applied. And there yeah, the third one on the need for multi-stakeholder assessments on how to mitigate and also enf enforce um, the rules. Um, so whom, who would like to go ahead? I can chip in if you. Perfect, Gabriela. Then we'll start with Gabriela and then give over to Benga. Okay. Well, thank you. I think these are very relevant questions, and uh, uh, it's true that the, that the technologies are global, and therefore this transnational character needs to be recognized. And and I feel that's why we we are all always referring to the interoperability, not only of the technical systems and the and the data flows uh, across countries, but we are also talking about interoperability of the legal systems, because at the end the kind of definitions that you have in one jurisdiction is going to be the, uh, determining the kind of outcomes when you go into international corporations for law enforcement. But, but at the end, the, the very basic uh, tenant of all this construction is to have the enforcement of, uh, of uh, the rule of law regarding these technologies at the national level. And this, is, and this is the emphasis that we are putting in the implementation of the recommendation on the ethics of AI in the in, in 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 with the many different countries with whom we are working because at the end governments need to have the capacity first to understand the technologies which is not as straightforward as it seems second to anticipate what kind of impact that they can have 
on the on the uh, many uh, uh, rights that they need to protect and then to have commensurate measures whenever there are there is harm and i think that this is another bottom line whenever there is harm there should be compensation mechanisms and these are the areas where governments need to upgrade their their capacities then of course we need international cooperation because at the end it would not work only if you have fragmentation regulatory fragmentation at the national level it's very important that we also have this kind of uh, of uh, exchanges uh, in a multi stakeholder approach to ensure that, that 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 we learn from each other and that we can also share what we what we know are the uh, those are that are the, the front running uh, developments uh, in terms of the legal frameworks and and those that are lagging behind but i feel again the role of governments is really important in trying to uh, ensure that the rule of law is respected but but that's that's a task and that's why they are paid for <laughs> Thank you, Gabriela. Fantastic. I can jump in and give some thoughts and uh, agree with a lot of what Gabriela said as well. I think on the, the sort of global piece, I think it's exactly right to look at these issues through a global lens. The risks that are presented are global, but I don't think that necessarily means that every single national regulation needs to look the same as each other. Exactly as Gabriella said, I think it's all about interoperability. And I think a big part of this will be developing some global standards in relation to how you evaluate these systems, for example, that different countries can then implement in a way that is um, uh, sensible for them. In terms of uh, sort of how to apply the law and where the law might apply, I think there is a large amount of existing domestic law that should be being applied right now in relation to AI systems. I think if, if you're in a country where you have a law against being able to discriminate against someone in providing a loan or access to housing, it shouldn't matter whether you're using AI or not, that law should apply. I don't think it should be an offense that, oh, you know, I, yes, I discriminate against this person and gave uh, loans on an unfavorable um, terms, but I was using AI, so don't come and um, penalize me. That's, that's not gonna hold. So I think existing law should be applied across various different um, jurisdictions, whilst we also put in place these other um, frameworks that address some of the specific uh, issues of of AI as well. And then in, in relation to the impact assessment process, I think it's a, it's a great thought. We are very enthusiastic about impact assessments at Microsoft. It's one of the many things that we're very enthusiastic about in relation to the UNESCO framework. We actually have an impact assessment as a core part of our responsible AI program at Microsoft. So any high risk system that is being developed, the product team has to go through an impact assessment. It has a number of human rights uh, related elements to it in relation to making sure the system is performing fairly, uh, addressing issues of bias. bias. Um, we think that's a fundamental sort of structured process to be able to, to go through. We actually have now started publishing the, the templates that we use for our impact assessment, and we've also published the guide that we use to help our colleagues navigate the impact assessment process. Um, we think it's really important to share our working as we go as a company so that others can, can quite frankly scrutinize and build on it and improve it. So we'd welcome um, thoughts that people have on, on the impact assessment template that we're using at Microsoft. Thank you. Uh, I mean, just, just to build on the earlier contributions, um, in terms of regulation being global and the fierce urgency of now, I mean, I, I can understand why, you know, that, you know, is, is the conversation that is happening because, you know, that's, that's a natural reaction to, to some of the confusion we've seen in the last, uh, in the last one year. Uh, but one is that, first of all, Regulation, and I think it's really important to say this, is that regulation is about creating standards and not implementing necessarily control. And I say this because this is the same conversation we had about data protection regulation uh, in many countries where it then became an opportunity for certain governments to seek legitimate control over areas where they were supposed to create standards. So the idea was to control and not to create standards that they were also uh, you know, going to go to a bad buy. But I, I think there are many existing processes that we can build on. And I can understand why global always um, you know, gives the idea of, of, of being slow because there's negotiation, there are countries that, I think there are some countries that may just want to be contrarian, uh, just so you know, uh, because they, they want to, you know, take the mic and speak or something. But 
uh, there are existing processes, and there are, there are things that work. I mean, I like the example that you gave of the International Civil uh, Aviation Organization. Uh, and I, there are many examples that we, we can look at. We can look, uh, you know, we can talk about some of the multi-stakeholder conversations we've had at ICANN, uh, you know, and now uh, at the IGF, and we can build on those processes. Um, and on the second question, just very quickly, I understand the concern. Uh, and, and like you said, there are many, you know, there are existing laws that, that can be applied. But I'm also a bit cautious when it comes to the sort of the tension between innovation and regulation um, and, and policy or regulation. I think that innovation will always, always, always be ahead of regulation. And what is important is for regulators and policymakers to at least seek to understand before regulating, because we've seen in many instances, uh, I mean, I know a country where we were working where cryptocurrency was banned, and we had to write a policy brief to the central bank. You, you can't ban this. this. What you're banning is the foundation of the new forms of money and movement. Uh, so I think it's really important to you know, create sandboxes where people can experiment ideas, but within you know, specific frameworks where if something goes wrong, of course, uh, the rules they have to apply, you know, abide by. But it's absolutely important that in the name of you know cautioning and not uh, you know not allowing people to go a wire that we're not stifling innovation because we've also seen that happen where regulation doesn't understand innovation and wants to jump ahead of it. Thanks, and I'll I'll pop in as well, Owen. Then um, the the first question I think is is a really important one, and I think the that idea that that we can't come up with the global framework i've said that a million times myself that you know uh, making a treaty isn't isn't going to get us there because it will take us too long and by the time we got it it would already be outdated um, but I think uh, Benga's answer and, and, and Owen and, and Gabriel as well have, have said some of the pieces that we have, and we need, to, we need to build piece by piece. One thing that we desperately need right now, and we talked about it in a conversation earlier today, is around a authoritative monitoring and observatory um, that will give us greater understanding of what the risks are and what's happening and be able to, for example, report on incidents or, or problems that arise with AI as well in a credible way. This is the type of thing, you know, using all the different analogies, um, the IPCC on, on the climate side, you know, looking for ways that we can better understand what's happening at a global level, and then that informs the national level is a key piece. The second thing I'd say is that we can now develop authoritative guidance on some of these issues, and then we need to have the ability to um, advise and support and the capacity to implement it at the national level. Those are all things that we can do with the framework as it currently exists. We can't mandate some of that to happen yet, um, but the more we have that authoritative guidance, the closer we'll get to a process where, where states will pick up the good practices and move forward with them. And what on the last point I'd make in terms of that global uh, dimension and the urgency issue is that there are areas where um, we don't have to wait for us to solve the overall AI picture. I mentioned earlier the issues around uh, watermarking provenance on uh, AI-generated images. That's something that we all ought to be concerned about and acting on now. The companies have made voluntary commitments in this regard. We'd really like to see that turned into something that's enforceable. Um, and it would be enforceable across uh, the industry in different ways, that you have to at least give transparency around uh, things that are generated uh, through AI, uh, and that would make a, a crucial difference. So we can uh, also chunk it into pieces where we can take up some of the most urgent issues that are already arising and address them in a concrete way. Um, and, and to just say on the, on the remedy and accountability issue, I, I do think it's a major issue. I agree with Owen's comments that we have to use the laws that already exist to do some of this. But um, I'd also say, though, that part of the problem in terms of the analogy on, on discrimination by AI systems is that we don't have enough transparency to know how to make those lawsuits and, and uh, legal remedies happen. So for me, one of the starting points there is to build more transparency into the systems. Thanks. Thank you. I think we have time for one more round. We can take two more questions. We have another five minutes. Is there anyone who's still curious? Then please uh, feel free to take the microphone. Uh, hello. Um, my name's Tom Barraclough, and I uh, have a think tank called the Brain Box Institute. And I also uh, manage something called the Action Coalition on Meaningful Transparency. 
Um, I have two questions, but I don't want to take both of them, so, so I'll leave it up to you as to how you respond. Um, one, the first question relates to, um, you are just talking about transparency and having enough transparency such that we can sort of test the way AI systems are working and, and hold uh, developers accountable to the standards that we set. I wonder if any of you have any comment on the way that uh, developing frameworks also require companies and governments to make adequate resourcing available to uh, the groups who we are expecting to hold these systems to account. It's one thing to say, here's a lot of information. It's a whole other thing to be able to meaningfully use that information to hold uh, powerful institutions to account. The other question I have is, um, I suppose it's a tough one related to human rights as a framework for AI. So in my work, I, I quite commonly say, we should use human rights as a framework for understanding what we expect of people using technology and developing technology. So I find it very useful. But in recent experience, I, I was sort of making this argument and the response came back to me that globally, uh, we're seeing a decline in states um, sort of backing human rights and liberal democratic frameworks. Do you have any comment on, you know, if a human rights framework is not landing from an advocacy perspective where we might turn to in order to sort of give effect to similar principles that underlie those in terms of human dignity and, and other factors like that. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm, my name is Quinton. I'm with the Tech Envoys office and maybe I could kind of respond to that a little bit by taking a step back and also thinking about the earlier question around speed and inclusion. Uh, from a political perspective, so there's a kind of paradox here. Everyone's talking about global standards, universally global standards, and everyone's talking about fast. And what I'd like to suggest in a minute is that perhaps in this case, um, I mean, there are reasons why that this could happen very quickly, including the fact that the private sector is very interested in interoperable governments so that they can move through jurisdictions easily without having, you know, different regulation in different jurisdictions. So there's a lot of kind of, of a carrot there. Um, but I'd like to suggest in this case, slow may be fast in a sense, because to get a global agreement to move from 20 countries, 50 countries, to 193 countries, all of those countries have to want this. And what we've noticed, at least on the Global Digital Compact process, is that the term human rights has often had certain connotations for certain groups of countries. Um, and as an example of that, we had a lot of submissions to the Global Digital Compact process and you know, from some of the political groups that were, say, from the Global North, human rights, we did a word count of how many times human rights was put in there. It was you know, a ratio compared to the words digital divide, it was in a ratio of up to 15 times. 15 times every time digital divide was mentioned, human rights was mentioned 15 times. For some of the other groups representing the Global South, human rights may have been mentioned zero times and digital divide several times. So completely the opposite. Now what I'm going to suggest is that when we think about human rights holistically, yes, we have the individual, civil, political, and, and, and uh, uh, kind of uh, rights. We also have the social, economic, and cultural rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 22 to 27. And these are also human rights. And these also need to be protected and governed for. And these are human rights which the whole world can get behind, including the right to work, employment, favorable um, pay, standard of living, education, uh, protection of authorship. So how can the, the world think about this topic of governance of AI from a holistic perspective um, and bring along the, the, the countries who have more urgent pressing needs on the economic side, on the development side, and take a holistic approach, not just geographically, to 193 countries, 
but also holistically from a governance perspective. So, um, and I'll, if you allow me one more kind of uh, interpreta interpretation here, we're talking a lot about regulation and legislation in this panel. But governance can also involve other types of policies, not just legal regulation, not even just ethical standards or technical standards. They can also involve other kinds of policies that impact incentives, from taxation, trade policy, intellectual property policy, which also, by the way, is one of the social, economic, cultural rights for authorship. Um, so how can the conversation be shaped in a way that governance can be thought of holistically across the different parts of the UN's work, um, not just the what is commonly thought of as human rights, the social and political rights, but also the economic, social, cultural rights, um, and the sustainable development goals? And how can all of these other countries who, when, when they hear human rights, they think it doesn't matter if we don't focus on economic side, to actually embrace a concept of governance that will, we talk here a lot about AI accelerating the SDGs, but how is that actually going to happen? I mean, we can talk about uh, productivity tools on Office Copilot 365, that's great for a lot of office workers in the West, but how does that actually put bread on the table? How do we get the climate resilient agriculture that people keep talking about? Does that actually involve different forms of economic policy like prizes or subsidies or even um, you know, incentive creating policies like in the COVID uh, challenge trials where the vaccine was developed in a matter of weeks instead of normally years? How does that happen to really get material impact on the SDGs? So I would say slow is fast in this to get a global 193 countries agreeing they have to see an interest in it, and to see an interest in it, we have to think of human rights holistically to include the whole Universal Declaration of Human Rights, not just a sub-part of it. And to get to that, we need a holistic approach to policy, which doesn't focus only on regulation, but also embraces other kinds. And that's why, when the Secretary General's put together his high-level advisory body on artificial intelligence, which will look at governance, there was an explicit choice to make it interdisciplinary, include voices from all regions, genders, but also from all disciplines, including digital economy, including anthropology, to look not just at the individual impacts on individuals' human rights, but also the societal impacts on individuals' social, economic, and cultural rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear uh, audience and dear panel. I would hand it back to Peggy for wrapping this up very quickly. <laughs> Well, thanks. Uh, Quinton already helped me out uh, with that assist on the human rights side, but I, I do think it, it's a crucial point and, and one that, that we need to think about is that human rights aren't only uh, when we use the words human rights, the digital divide and, and what it means for people who are, are suffering uh, for the lack of technology is also a human rights and falls into the basket of economic, social, and cultural rights as, as Quinton has described. Um, but we have to get away from, uh, from a, a terminology debate and move forward on the issues that we've discussed today. I see the facilitator for the Global Digital Compact here as well. There's a lot of work to be done in building that global framework, but uh, it does need to be done across sectors and across rights, um, but also across communities, countries, and people. And that means finding the ways to bring in all of those who are going to be affected by these choices in a much more effective way. And that goes to the second part of the question that you asked, which is how do we make sure that the resources are available to do it? I think that's a fundamental piece here, that we need investment in this global public good. And that does mean, and I think Owen even brought up, the need for that social infrastructure to be built, and that means public compute. Uh, uh, resources that will allow the researchers to be able to do the research that we all know we need them to do. So it's really looking at those questions and finding a way uh, that we can make sure that those who are making the profits out of this are also helping us potentially to invest in the ways that we can make sure that, that this opportunity side of artificial intelligence is there for all of us. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks to the, the wonderful panel that we've had with us today, and I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the IGF. Thank you. Thank you.